Now I want you to open your Bible, please, to two places. First of all, to the book of Joel, chapter 2. And then I would like you to open to the book of the Revelation, chapter 6. When we concluded our last study, we were just approaching now the announcement of the day of the Lord as we uh, find it here in chapter 2. We're going to look at the descriptive terms of that day of the Lord, a time of judgment when God will vindicate His righteousness and His holiness on the earth. Now we're going to look at some of the descriptive terms of the day of the Lord. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 15 for just a moment. There it is called a day of destruction. It's called a destruction from the Almighty. That means that the destruction that comes, comes from the hand of God. God brings it to pass. The locust plague destroyed all vegetation in the land. And Joel reminded the people that the judgment was from the Lord. God sent it. And we're going to learn from our study of the book of Amos that nothing happens by chance or accident. For every effect, there is a cause. The Almighty God is in control. Now, the proper noun Almighty, as you have it in uh, chapter 1, verse 15, is used of God only, because God only has absolute and unlimited power. And when God sends a calamity, it is always preceded by wickedness. The flood in Noah's day illustrates this. You read carefully the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. And you'll find, beginning with verse 5, that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. I will destroy man. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 7. I say again that wickedness is preceded, or, or destruction is preceded by wickedness. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 6. So you have then the same phrase in Isaiah 13, 6 that you have here in Joel chapter 1, verse 15. It's a destruction from the Almighty. Many things are happening in the world today. Just pick up your newspaper or catch the late news at night or the early evening news, and you'll find that catastrophe and calamity and all kinds of evil are taking place in the world today. War and upheaval and rape and murder and disease, and homicides in every city. This seems to be what's capturing the attention of the people in the news today. Earthquakes, we have never seen so many earthquakes. And uh, people are on the verge of expectancy, on the tiptoe of expectancy. Destruction from the Almighty. And I'm saying it again, beloved, nothing happens by chance or accident. For every effect, there is a cause. And there is a day of destruction coming from the Almighty. Then in chapter 2, verse 2, Joel calls it a day of darkness. A day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Now the Bible speaks of a literal or physical darkness, such as the plague of darkness in Egypt, where we read in Exodus chapter 10, verse 21, even darkness which may be felt. And then a similar darkness appeared the awful moment that our blessed Lord was crucified. We read in Matthew 27, 45, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Now in both instances, the darkness was associated with judgment, which was preceded by wickedness. And some prophetic passages which speak of darkness when Christ returns in judgment are Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 and 10, and Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 7, Matthew chapter 24. I think one of the most significant passages on judgment begins with the sixth chapter of the book of the Revelation. And from that sixth chapter on, as the seals of the book of destiny were opened, the judgment period for the earth is depicted. Christ as the lion lamb who holds the title deed to the earth by right of creation and by right of redemption is going to take over. Chapters 4 and 5 are scenes in heaven, but the believers have been raptured and have received their crowns or rewards by that time. And the giving of the crown belongs to that period after the rapture of the church, so that after the redeemed, 
have been removed from the earth and have received their rewards, then earth's official representative, the Lord Jesus Christ, takes command. He takes over. And the earth must receive him. But first, the righteous judgment of God must be meted out to the inhabitants of the earth who have rejected him. And that's the judgment period beginning with chapter 6 of the book of the Revelation. Isaiah calls it the day of vengeance of our God. Isaiah 61, verse 2. We have an idea that God is a loving, tender God, and he is. But there's a day coming when God must make sinners pay for their wickedness. It's called the day of vengeance of our God. Now, we're living in the day of grace. And, beloved, we can be, be saved today. Sinners can can be redeemed today. But there's coming a day of judgment. God will not tolerate indefinitely the wickedness in the hearts of men. And that day is coming. And I believe it's drawing near. It cannot be said of any period in the history of mankind that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. But the time is drawing near when it will take place, when our Lord comes back to earth again. Now, up to the present hour, God's throne has not been one of judgment. It's been one of grace. And uh, the day is coming when it will be a throne of judgment. And judgment is going to fall. Now, that's what Joel was talking about. The day of the Lord is a coming day of judgment. It's called the day of destruction. It's called a day of darkness. And the scene in Revelation 6, like the scene in Joel chapter 2, is a judgment scene. And the throne is a judgment throne. And now as each seal is opened in Revelation, God's judicial action is revealed, one stage at a time. And you're going to see the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy begin to be fulfilled. And one of the four beasts or living creatures is the spokesman in Revelation 6, and he announces coming judgment. Now, Joel is describing that judgment. He says it's a day of destruction and a day of darkness. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned that that would be literal, could be literal and physical darkness, but darkness is also used figuratively as symbolic of ignorance and spiritual blindness. Paul spoke of unbelievers as having the understanding darkened, Ephesians 4.18, and who bring forth the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. Now, for the true believer in Christ, the darkness is past. And John, in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 8, says, The true light now shineth. And again, we read in Ephesians 5.8, For ye Christians were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, Walk as children of light, Ephesians 5 eight. Now, Joel says there is a gloominess associated with the darkness. Do you see it in verse 2? Now, that's significant of sorrow and distress, which leads to dejection and to depression. It was such a day for Israel when the Assyrian power invaded the land. And it will be just that kind of a day when Joel's prophecy reaches its final fulfillment in the future day of the Lord. But all the redeemed of the Lord may rejoice that he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Yes, there's a dark, dreadful day coming. It's a day of destruction. It's a day of darkness. And that's what the book of the Revelation, beginning with chapter 6, is all about. Now, we have to keep in mind that, that this judgment is due mankind. It's due mankind. It has to come. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Then you will find also that it's a day of distress. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 11. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? Now, both Obadiah... And you'll find that in verses 14 and 15. And Zephaniah, in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, taught that the day of the Lord would be a time of distress. And that means a period during which there would be pain and anxiety and emotional and mental disturbance. Joel used the word terrible, suggesting that it would be fearful and a depressing experience. Every visitation of judgment from God has been preceded by a warning. I like that. That's interesting to me, and it's comforting. 
God never strikes without warning. Before he sent the flood, he raised up Noah, and Noah preached the gospel for 120 years to the people who turned their ears away from it. They would have none of it. But that judgment of the flood in Noah's day uh, was preceded by a solemn warning from God. But of which judgment is the Lord warning his people here in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 11? Well, it certainly could not be a mere plague of, of locusts while there was destruction and darkness and distress during the locust plagues recorded in chapter 1. The day of which Joel speaks in chapter 2 is described in unusual language. Verse 2 says, There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it. You see, the immediate fulfillment occurred with the Assyrian invasion, which came close upon the time of Joel. But the impending and final fulfillment awaits the day of Christ's coming after the Great Tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. You see, the Lord Jesus describes that day of judgment the same as Joel. The scriptures are consistent. They are harmonious. There is never a contradiction in the Bible. Now, the descriptive language in Joel chapter 2, verse 2, resembles too closely that which was spoken by Christ in Matthew twenty four twenty one to disassociate it completely from the great tribulation and from our Lord's second coming to the earth. If these verses in Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, can be explained allegorically and prophetically, and I believe they can, then the plague of locusts under which the people suffered was but a faint picture of a more severe suffering to come. Now, here we have a unique blending of different time elements and different events. These verses should not be confined to a second literal locust plague localized in Judah in Joel's time. We read in verse 3, A great people and a strong are likened to the devouring locust which devoured the vegetation and left the land desolate. As the locust swept over the land like a devouring fire, so the Assyrian armies from the north will ravage the land as the Garden of Eden, as, as the land was in the Garden of Eden. Now, if the prophet is making any reference here to a locust plague, he's using it as, a, as, as symbolizing the character of the judgment of God. He is speaking of real warriors under the figure of real locusts. Yes, beloved, Joel was addressing his own contemporaries in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and sounding an alarm of a calamity which was imminent. And from this, we agree with those expositors that the phrase, the day of the Lord, must not always be interpreted to mean the end of the present age and the coming world kingdom of Christ. But we do not agree with our brethren who insist that the visitation here means locusts literally and nothing else. Joel is undoubtedly speaking of a future judgment. And that judgment ties in with all that the Bible teaches in other passages. One cannot read our Lord's uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and not see that Joel is looking ahead to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. One cannot read the book of the Revelation beginning with chapter 6 and, and uh, fail to see that what Joel is mentioning dovetails perfectly with what the Apostle John wrote of the second coming of Christ to the earth. The whole scene here is a judgment scene. I think we're very foolish people if we believe that the world can have peace as long as evil, godless men are the heads of nations. Out of World War I came the League of Nations, but it failed because there was no power to prevent a self-seeking nation from withdrawing. Out of World War II came the United Nations Organization, admittedly today a failure, as well as being financially bankrupt. The Nuremberg trial revealed that from 1933 to 1941, Germany had violated 69 treaties. All of this foreshadows the awful days that are ahead immediately following the rapture of the true church from earth to heaven. The rider upon the red horse in Revelation, most likely the same person who's riding the white horse, 
now reveals his identity. He's not the Prince of Peace. He's Satan's counterfeit. He's an imposter. Imagine, if you can, a world without any peace at all. And that's what's coming upon the earth. And so Joel is describing that day. He says it's a day of distress. It's a day of darkness. It's a day of destruction. And uh, it's coming upon the world, literally, actually, not figuratively. And we have to keep in mind, beloved, that what God says in his Bible prophetically must come to pass. One of the strongest evidences for the inspiration and inerrancy of the Bible are the fulfilled prophecies in Scripture. If I had no other evidence to prove the inspiration of the Bible, it would be the prophecies that have been fulfilled. That, to me, is proof conclusive that the Bible is the inspired, the inerrant word of the living God. And I accept it as the word of God. Now, just as prophecies have been fulfilled, so those that are predicted that are unfulfilled as of today must come to pass. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, sounding an alarm, first of an immediate judgment of the Assyrian army, but looking ahead to the coming day of God's judgment on the earth. When Jesus Christ comes back again, and at the conflict of Armageddon, uh, the nations are punished and individuals are judged for their wickedness. Yes, there's a judgment coming. It's called in the book of Joel, the day of the Lord. Now, you'll notice in, in, in Joel chapter 2, there's also a, a, a summing, the summing of an assembly. And, and this is important because um, the, the people are called together and God wants the people to have a voice from him. And so he has to call them together to listen. Now, that begins uh, with uh, Joel chapter 2 and verse 12. I like to read verses uh, 12 and 13. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. You see, the alarm announcing the coming judgment is followed by a more urgent appeal to repent. You read verses 12 and 13. You can't think harshly of God. When you read those two verses, you have to say God is a gracious God. God is long-suffering. God is extending his grace and mercy. He's appealing to people to turn to him. And this is what the Lord is doing here in the book of Joel. Now the word turn here has in it the idea of repentance, meaning a change of mind, that will result in a change of behavior. You see, their turning back to God had to be genuine. They can't be make, it can't be make-believe. It can't be phony. It has to be for real. He said, turn to me with all your heart. Did you notice that in verses 12 and 13? In other words, it has to be a whole-hearted, not a half-hearted thing. It's possible that they're fasting. They're weeping in their mourning could be a mere outward demonstration without the real heart experience. God requires more than an outward show of feigned repentance. He told his people they must repent with all your heart, that is, with their total being, spirit, mind, and body. The appeal from the Lord to his people is, come back to me with all your heart. That's what he's saying. Come back to me with all your heart. Do it for real. Be, be genuine about it. Turn from your wicked way. Come back to me wholeheartedly with all your heart. Then in verse 13, he says, Rend your heart and not your garments. That's an interesting statement. Now, that means something to, or to the Jews because the tearing of one's garment was an outward expression of inward grief or remorse. You might remember that both Reuben and his father Jacob rent their clothes when they thought Joseph had been killed back in Genesis chapter 37. You remember how Joseph's brother, brothers had sold him. First they put him in the pit, and then he was sold into slavery. And uh, uh, they, they thought that Joseph had been killed. And they were expressing deep grief at the thought of Joseph's death. And we are told that they, 
they rent their clothes or they rent their garments. Then two over in the book of Numbers, Joshua and Caleb rent their clothes when the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, uh, expressing their remorse for the people's sin. When Achan stole the gold and the silver and the Babylonish garment, Joshua and the elders of Israel rent their clothes and fell on their faces before the ark of the Lord, an expression of sorrow because of Achan's sin. That's recorded in Joshua chapter 7. Now there are other references in Scripture to this ancient custom in Israel of, of renting the garment. It's uh, recorded in Second Samuel 1, Second Samuel 3, Second Kings 22. This idea of rending the garment was intended to signify a sincere turning to the Lord. But there was always the possibility that a person might indicate outwardly by rending his garment a sorrow and a remorse when all the while there was no sincerity in the heart. It's a very easy matter for any of us to replace the reality with a mere outward sign. But God requires more than the mere outward sign. God demands genuine contrition and repentance. Rend your heart. Rend your heart. David's confession in Psalm 51 is an excellent example of the rent heart. David wrote, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalm 51 and verse 17. So you can see that God demands genuineness. God's not going to allow us to make believe. He says, now don't just go to church and, and go through your prayer and bring your offering and sing your songs. There has to be the genuine repentance, the sorrow and the remorse of the heart. And so we have then this call. Now it's in the very nature of God to be ready and willing to forgive. It is true, God does forgive. It's in the very nature of God to do this. When Jonah repented and went to Nineveh, he discovered that God was gracious, God was merciful. Back in the book of Jonah, in chapter 4, verse 2, we read where he prayed, I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repented thee of the evil. When any one of us turns to God in true confession, this is exactly how we will find God. When we come to him with dedication and purpose of heart, his tender compassion is guaranteed every one of us. Who can tell if God will not turn from his wrath and give a blessing? The first stroke of judgment had fallen with the locust plague. However, further judgment could be averted if the people would repent and turn from their sins to God. Look at verse 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. All that was lost in the plague of locusts recorded in chapter 1, including the meal and drink offerings, God made available to the nation if only they would repent. Now included in the appeal was the calling of an assembly. Verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Now, the first trumpet in chapter 2, verse 1, was to sound an alarm. But this second trumpet was to call an assembly. All were to be present, the elderly, the young, the infants, even the bridegroom and the bride. Notice verse 16. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Everybody was to be present. Um, uh, mention the infants, even the bridegroom and the bride here in this passage. Because, uh, now, now, that's not the usual way to do it. Uh, uh, mention is made of the bridegroom and his bride because ordinarily uh, a newlywed couple on their honeymoon would be excused from all public gatherings. This exemption included the entire uh, first year of marriage. According to Deuteronomy chapter 24, when a couple got married, they were excused from a lot of functions the first year. It was a year of adjustment and uh, getting acquainted with one another. And what, what Joel was saying is, if the people have a heart to do God's will, God will give to them another chance. He'll give them another opportunity. 
Now, he's not dealing here with salvation. There is no second chance after death. A person who dies in rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ does not get another chance. But God is here dealing with his children, his own people. Now, notice, led by the priest, God's ministers to his people, the very words to be prayed were given to them in verse 17. Imagine the prayer was prepared. All they had to do was pray it sincerely from the heart, not merely mouth it now with words. Look at verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? The prayer was one of intercession and one of supplication, and it expressed a twofold need. First, that Israel might be spared an invasion of a Gentile nation and be subdued under the rule of that nation. That was the first thing in the prayer. And that would be a terrible disgrace for the nation, God's people, Israel, to have a Gentile nation subject them and rule them. And then second, the more serious result that would follow, namely, the good name of the Lord would be brought into disrepute. If a heathen nation were to overpower Israel, they could say in a sarcastic and an ironic manner, where's your God? Where's your God? You see, the unbelieving nation surrounding Israel would mock the Lord as a God who was not able to protect his own people who worshipped him. Back early in Israel's history, God promised his people that if they would obey him, this tragedy would never happen. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 6, God said, Thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. Now, that was a conditional promise. As long as Israel walked in obedience to God, God would protect them and see that they would never be overrun, overpowered by a Gentile nation. But of course we know that Israel disobeyed God. And as a result, Israel has suffered many defeats, first at the hands of the Babylonian Empire, and then uh, Assyria and Greece and Rome. And even today, the nation is being assaulted on every hand. Why? Because they will not acknowledge the Messiah. They will not come to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And beloved, this principle operates today in the lives of God's children. We cannot refuse to obey Obey God and expect God's blessing. We read in Psalm 106, verses 41 and 42, God gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Psalm 106, verses 41 and 42. All of this brought reproach upon both Israel and upon Jehovah. The appeal was intended to avoid such a disaster. God appeals to his people today. I believe if the church, and by the church, I mean all the children of God, the born-again ones, beloved, if we all had our hearts right with God, if we had given ourselves in subjection to God, I believe that God has a great blessing to be poured out upon, upon the United States of America. And that's true of any nation. But if we refuse to obey God, if we're going to violate all the rules in the book, then we're going to have to pay for it. The psalmist said in a prayer to God, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. Psalm 76, verse 10. Just as men like Nebuchadnezzar and Hitler were instruments in God's hands, so it'll be when the Antichrist appears. And remember the book of Joel is prophesying the day of the Lord. That's the time of great tribulation and sorrow on the earth. There will be unprecedented misery and woe and suffering and famine and death and disease during that period of time. That's all the judgment from God. God can stir up the heart of a wicked man and impel the fury of that man and in this way display his own power and glory even as he did in times past. No matter what the enemies of God do, at length all will redound to God's praise and to God's glory, inasmuch as they cannot in any degree prevail against God. Evil men, like, like world leaders, uh, are to be pitied rather than feared. Beloved, God is never on the side of might when the mighty are wrong. 
Men are mere puppets in the hands of Almighty God. When Antichrist appears, he shall deceive many, according to Matthew 24, 5, and have all in subjection to himself, according to Revelation 13. But it won't be for long. You see, the Antichrist will be but acting under God's mandate. The authority that the Antichrist displays was given to him, and it will be given to him. It's by the permissive will of God that he comes forth, and he will come forth. Joel is telling us that there's great judgment on ahead. He calls it the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Now, beginning with verse 18, we, we have the announcement that the, uh, the answer is sure. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Now, beginning with verse 18, we have an assuring word that God will answer the prayer of the priests and reverse the punishment upon the people, but only upon the condition that they repent and turn to God with all their heart. Now, this section of chapter 2 opens with the word, then. Please note that in your Bible, verse 18. Now, this is a word suggesting both time and condition. Verse 19 says the Lord will answer. When or at what time will he answer? when Israel meets the condition laid down by God. Verse 18 says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Then will the Lord... Then, when? Well, when the people obey God. The answer is conditioned upon the obedience of the nation. Now, notice God's promise to Israel. And I think it would do, do us well if we, uh, if we read verses 18 through 27 and take notice of the I wills of Jehovah. I'm going to read these verses and keep your ballpoint pen ready. And I want you to notice the wills. I'm beginning with verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his sting shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the gate fat and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will Restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Have you noticed the I wills of God there? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer. He said, I will send you corn and wine and oil. I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. I will remove far off from you the northern army. The Lord will do great things. He will cause to come down for you the rains. Just as soon as they acknowledge their sins and turn to God wholeheartedly, then he will answer them and provide their total needs. He said to Jeremiah, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3. You see, God's promise to Israel in those I wills. Now notice God's provision for Israel. Verse 19, I will send you corn and wine and oil. And what God will do for his repentant people, he sets forth in explicit detail. The terms corn and wine and oil can be used figuratively as representing the produce of the earth, the food supplies that the people needed so sorely. God will restore these in ample sufficiency. After all, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The psalmist wrote it, and the apostle Paul reiterated in his first epistle to the Corinthians, God owns the earth, beloved. God knows how to provide all of our needs. 
It was David who testified, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's seed begging bread. Psalm 37, 25. Again in Psalm 84, 11 we read, No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. This earth is God's earth, beloved. He created it, and he controls it, and he can cause it to produce and prosper bountifully, or he can withhold even the necessities of life. Israel was well acquainted with all of this, and now she must decide either to continue in sin or repent and return to the Lord. God is able to provide all we need, but God is under no obligation to do so when we walk in willful disobedience. Food for both man and the animals would be amply provided if the people would turn to God and repent of their sins. This is the, the promise that God gives to his people. Now, he's, he's warning of coming judgment, but he says he'll withhold the judgment if the people will repent, forsake their sins, and come back to God. Notice the 19th verse. I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Now, that word heathen means Gentiles. Now, after the promise to provide their natural or material needs, God promises to preserve his name among the nations. The reproach Israel brought upon themselves and upon the Lord will be lifted when they repent and return to him. It was God's intention that Israel should be the head among the nations, not the tail. He wanted that his people should be above the nations, not beneath them. However, their exalted position in the earth was conditional. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. Deuteronomy 28:13. Beloved, God does not make blanket promises to do anything and everything for us regardless of our attitude toward him. If we insist on disobeying God, there is a price that must be paid. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And Israel had disobeyed God, and there were just no chance of God ever giving them all these blessings if they continued in disobedience. There's a day of the Lord coming. It's the day of judgment. And, and God must vindicate his righteousness and his holiness on this earth because the earth is, is the only planet where, where human beings live. You don't find man on any other planet. And, and people on the planet are the people for whom Christ died. And the word of God was directed to people on planet earth. Therefore, we are responsible to God. And our behavior will determine what God will do for us as individuals and for our nation. We are desperately in need of prayer, and we Christians should include in our daily prayers that there might be a revival and a repentance and a returning to God here in our beloved United States of America. God said, I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, that is, among the other Gentile nations. Well, our time is up.